In the weekly educational magazine Look and Learn from 7th of March 1964, there was a special report, We Sail with the Floating School. Well, I went on one such cruise with Eastfields High School in 1971 and I kept the souvenir booklet and the logbook and my various notes. The itinerary was to fly from Gatwick to Venice, board the ship, sail to Heraklion, then Alexandria, followed by Izmir, Itia, and back to Venice in order to fly back to the UK. But first, some information about the ship itself, the Navassa. The Navassa was originally built to the order of BI, the British India Steam Navigation Company Limited, by Barclay Curl and Company Limited, and was delivered in July 1956 for charter to HM Government as a troop ship. When the sea trooping contracts terminated, it was decided to convert the Navassa for use as a school ship. The extensive work was carried out by Silly Cox and Company Limited at Falmouth at a cost in excess of half a million pounds. Navassa has been adapted to carry 1,100 dormitory passengers in 50 dormitories of various sizes, each with adjacent showers and lavatories, and 307 cabin passengers. She has 17 classrooms seating 420 and an assembly hall seating 460. There is also a recreation room for private study for about 100 students. Deck spaces for deck games such as tug of war, deck hockey and deck quoits. Cost. Overall cost of the trip, £67. Weekly payments would earn interest so this was encouraged. The fact that interest was being made shows that our money didn't stay in one place. This shows that BI were making extra profits by lending out our money to firms and collect interest on it. Most people did pay their money in this way, but others, like myself, paid in a big amount, waited six months or so, and paid in another amount until all money was paid in. Pocket money. Recommended limit of pocket money, £12. This was agreed by our school to be the limit. Other schools, such as Science School, Isleworth Hounslow, brought as much money as they liked. One kid took £22 so he could buy a £7 coat in Greece. All payments were to be in by the end of February 1971. We were to have about £1.50 per port leaving, £4.50 for on the Navassa. Amount of money per port in countries, currency, Venice, 2,000 lira, where 1,500 lira equals one pounds, all Greek ports, 100 drachma, where 72 drachma was one pound, Turkey, 40 lirasai, where 30 lirasai is one pound. In Itia, we were issued with sterling so as not to have to muck about with leftover drachma. Preparations. Tea party for half of Merton's pupils on the cruise held at Eastfields High School on February the 4th, 1971. Pre-cruise briefing with slides given by education officer. Planetarium visit on February the 12th, 1971. Visit to planetarium for a talk on the Mediterranean sky at night. A parents meeting was also held. They were informed as what was to happen on the Navassa, pupils facilities, etc. All facts to their interest were conveyed to them. Parents asked questions, etc. Note please, these meetings were held by the schools on their own. There was not a mass meeting. Meetings of pupils concerned in our school were held every Wednesday. Times of vaccinations, visits and parents meetings were told then. All information was given out. It was agreed upon how much money per port was to be taken. At these meetings we agreed on the shore party groups, who was to be the leaders of the groups, etc. In the final weeks we were told what dormitories we were in. 18 in one dormitory and 12 in another. Both dormitories were next to each other. 
We were told what classrooms Mr. Dragoin and Mr. Winston were in. At the final meeting, we were told what classroom group we were in, what classroom we were in, and what teacher we'd been lumbered with. We were issued with dormitory badges for our dormitory. We were told the time of meeting on the 8th of March, what the coach number was, flight numbers, etc. Our flight number was MQ881 on a SAM caravel from Gatwick, about 1700 hours. We were ready to go. March 8th, 1971. We all met in the music room at our school with our luggage and parents who wanted to say goodbye at 2 p.m. We left on a 41-seater coach for Gatwick at 2.30 p.m. Even though a meal was to be provided on the plane, we probably wouldn't get it until 6 p.m. or so, so we had our own dinner at home before leaving. Anyway, we arrived at Gatwick Airport about 4 p.m. We boarded the plane at 5.15 and were in the air by 5.30. The aircraft was a caravel, which belonged to Societa Area Mediterranea Airways. The sky was cloudy over South England, so we couldn't see much. It was clear over France, though, and snow-covered fields could be seen. It was beginning to get dark as we went over the Alps, and by the time we were at the airport, it was well into the night. At Marco Polo Airport at 7.30pm, we got onto a coach which was to take us into Venice for the water bus. The road from the airport was covered on both sides by advertisement boards. On the motorway, the Italian drivers were driving madly. All the car number plates had the letters VE to show that the car came from Venice. The coach stopped at a coach and water bus terminal where we boarded a water bus for the ship. The canal was used by a lot of water buses. Once on the ship, we were taken by one of the ship's defects to our dormitories. This was about 8.30pm. The dormitory looked very small and hostile to me, but I soon got used to it. We then asked as to where our luggage was, and once finding out that, we went to the promenade deck forward to get our luggage. I had a little difficulty in finding my suitcase. It looked so much like everyone else's. I eventually found it with some help from Ken Price. After that, we were told to go to our muster station, which was near where our luggage was. A man there told us about the muster station and our life jacket compartment. It was about nine o'clock when it was announced that late night supper was being served in the cafeteria. The supper consisted of a ham sandwich, a few biscuits and a cup of hot soup. I threw most of it away. At 9.30, all students should go now to their dormitories, was announced. Good night, students. He finished off with. We never got to sleep until very late. We were talking and laughing, which seemed to annoy the master at arms. Eventually got to sleep though. Our dormitory, Cunningham, looked like this. 9th of March 1971. All arrangements made in the two dormitories last night before lights out at 10. School uniform had to be worn for the shore visits. The reason for this rule was not only so that we look smart, but also if anyone got lost, which was quite easy in Venice, the locals would easily remember someone in uniform when asked. Anyway, after breakfast, Eastfield's Party Q was eventually called to our muster station and from there to disembark. Down the steps onto the concrete platform connected to the land. Separating us from the main pathway was a metal fence and to get round this fence we had to go into and out of a customs building which looked more like a warehouse than anything else. So, after checking that we were all present, we all stumbled off to the St Mark's Square. We separated into our groups of six and set off to look around the place. The souvenir vendors dealt with English money, but it seems they didn't know we'd gone decimal, and the new and old pence got them slightly confused. I actually saw some Italian television. In a shop window, that is. All it was, though, was a test card. A newspaper store was where we found out who won last night's fight. It was Frazier. Frazier Batte Clay, the newspaper said. I bought a newspaper for 80 lira, about five and a third pence. Il Giorno was the newspaper, with a date Martidi 9 Marzo on it. In the newspaper, the comic strips Andy Cap 
and The Wizard of Iz were being published. I also found that my horoscopo said, Safari, è il momento di cambiar pagina e di recommenciare di zero. Sentimenti osta colo in teso. Salute, bueno. I don't know what it means, but it sounds good. I made some entries into the logbook. Fourth day, personal log. Arrived at Heraklion at 0800 hours. An American battleship was about to leave, and a cargo ship called the Minas was also just coming in. An organised tour was laid on, and those in Phase 1, including myself, went on the tour in the morning. Those in Phase 2 went on independent sightseeing around Heraklion. The tour was to the Minoan Palace at Knossos, then to the museum in Heraklion, where the original paintings, etc., were taken from the ruins of the palace. In the afternoon, we went on private sightseeing in groups of six around Heraklion. Visited the market and town centre. I bought a letter opener with the double axe design. We went into a cafe in a side street for a Coca-Cola. The owner knew little English, but we eventually got through to him and got what we wanted. He ended up showing us family photographs of his sister who lives in North London. Got back to ship 20 minutes late. Mr. Trigoing was not very happy. Fifth day, personal log. Arrived near Alexandria Port at about 1700 hours in stormy weather. Alexandria Port closed due to this weather. Navassa was told to wait along with 30 or more other ships waiting to get into Alexandria. The bad weather was said to have been in Alexandria area for a couple of days. During the dinner meals, the captain announced he had been in touch with BI in London and had been instructed to wait at Alexandria until the morning. And if then the ship was still waiting to get into port, the captain should turn around and head for Izmir, Turkey. An alternative trip to Athens was being arranged if in the event that entry into the port was impossible. Due to the bad weather, quite a few people were feeling ill, except, of course, the crew and ship's company. Sixth day, personal log. Navassa was not able to enter Alexandria, so therefore turned around and headed for Izmir. Bad weather continued, thus rendering about 70% of students ill. In our dormitory, Cunningham, only three people remained fit. They were G. Torch. B. Theobald, and C. Brown. Two others who said they would never be sick later in the day became victims. K. Davies brought up quite a bit onto G. Torch's bunk. Torch had to sleep on a spare bunk in Codrington dormitory. K. Smith, who had been through worse weather in previous cruise, was sick about 2300 hours. The weather calmed down by about 1600 hours, and so did our stomachs. Thirteenth day, personal log. Rivali at 0630 hours. All suitcases had to be on promenade deck before 0800 hours. So there was not much time left. All sheets were to be put into one sheet, all pillows into one pillowcase, and blankets to be folded and left with the pillows on the bed. 07.15 hours, breakfast. By 08.30 hours, dormitories were out of bounds. This was the procedure for all those leaving the ship today for home. All those in phase one. Meanwhile in England, some schools were getting ready, or had already done so, to leave to go to Venice, for cruise number 216. All hand luggage was to be taken to the games room. Nothing was left to do except looking at Venice or sitting in the recreation room. Those in phase two went on sightseeing in Venice. They weren't to leave until tomorrow. At 1100 hours, lunch. 11.55 we were called to the assembly hall for the pre-flight briefing. At 12.20 we left the ship for the water bus. C. Brown was not feeling well at this time. 
After the water bus, we got a coach to Marco Polo Airport. Left the airport on flight DA2925 at 14.35. Arrived at Gatwick at 16.25. But by this time, Chris was really ill. Had to return to Mitcham without him. We got back to the school at 18.45. C. Brown was taken home from Gatwick Hospital by a cruise man in his car. He arrived home an hour later than we did.